Hello, everyone. I'm super excited. Patrick and I are joined today by the trust and safety team that reviews the extensions that get submitted to the Chrome Web Store. We get so many questions from developers about how the review process works. We mentioned those to you, and you were all super excited to come and join us and to chat to developers. I'd love to get started by just sort of going around, and if you could introduce yourself, maybe say a little bit about what you do. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Zach Minster. I'm an analyst on the team, a security analyst. I've been on the team for about four years, and uh, my background is primarily in cybersecurity. Great. Uh, hey, um, my name is Vijay. I lead our Chrome extension security team uh, within trust and safety at Google. Um, I'm based on the Bay Area, and most of my work has been in network security and consulting. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Cameron Lanier, part of the Chrome extension trust and safety team. I've been for the I've been on the team for a couple of years now. Um, I was originally a software developer, and now I transitioned into the security space, and it's been a great ride ever since. Hey everyone, my name is Lofton Anderson. Um, I was uh, I've been on the team for a few year, years as well. Um, I am an analyst on the team. Uh, my background comes from more of the uh, the web development side of things, um, so it's been really nice to kind of use that experience um, as a launching pad into the kind of Chrome extension ecosystem. Yeah, and of course, Oliver, we know each other. We're both uh, <laughs> yep. Chrome developer relations for uh, Chrome extensions. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for joining. I was really, really excited to see how excited you guys were to be here and to talk about questions. Um, we didn't have to drag you in here. <laughs> the door is not locked. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining. Yeah, I'm so glad to have all of you with us. And we did some sort of in individual introductions, but I'd love to sort of get a better idea for mm -hmm. what your team is responsible for. I know developers may have seen the Chrome Web Store team that is... Uh, responsible for a lot of what happens on the Chrome Web Store, and sometimes they'll post a blog post about something new that's coming to the store. How how does your work interact with their work, and what's the separation? Yeah, uh, no. First up, thanks for having us, guys. Mm -hmm. um, so cr Chrome's Chrome's mission has always been to make the web work better for its users, mm -hmm. right? Uh, providing users a more tailored experience, right? With what they want to do on a daily basis, uh, and extensions actually fit in very nicely into that mission. Uh, because it gives you so much more that you can do with extensions. And there are multiple teams, as you rightly pointed out, it takes a village. So there are multiple teams that come together. Uh, there's you guys to begin with, right? Our, our developer relations team, uh, there's product, there's engineering, there's user experience, there's research, uh, legal policy, and trust and safety. While these teams may be housed in, in different uh, organizations, but they all work together seamlessly to deliver our mission. So when you see these announcements, uh, when you see these, these features, um, being spoken of in blog posts, um, multiple teams in varying degrees of contribution have come together to deliver those. Uh, so your trust and safety, what is it that trust and safety does? Like, uh, presumably you're not shipping features for the Chrome Web Store. You didn't do the new redesign or something like that. But what is trust and safety for folks who aren't Google employees and can look it up on our org chart? <laughs> oh, no, thanks for asking. Uh, my, my parents ask me that all the time. So <laughs> it, it, it's fair enough. Um, trust and safety at Google is primarily responsible for the safety of its users and for making sure that Google products um, and developers um, comply with the policies and the terms of service that they agree to, right? Um, and as part of that, the team, this team, particular team, is responsible for reviewing the extensions our developers submit to us, mm -hmm. making sure they're safe for the end users, making sure they comply with policies, right? Um, and again, we are also responsible in case, I mean, we are humans, we could make mistakes, right? So we're also <laughs> responsible um, to our developer community, right? Um, when they reach out to us, if they have questions to us mm -hmm. on certain decisions that we make with respect to their items on the store. Gotcha. And you mentioned that review is part of that. I'm curious, why is review important? Why is it that we have to have that as part of our policy enforcement? It'd be a lot easier to develop without any kind of review if you could just <laughs> put the code directly out there. Yeah, it certainly would. But uh, <laughs> I, I, like Vijay was saying earlier, uh, extensions are very like a way that users can make a browsing experience like more of their own, right? Uh, and they, in order to meet the needs of a variety of different users, they have to have a lot of different capabilities. And turns out some of those capabilities are pretty powerful, uh, right? Like in order to in order to provide a lot of those tailor-made experiences and, and really augment the entire browsing experience, um, you know, the developers know there's a lot of APIs and there's a lot of, you know, things they can do with them. And a lot of those APIs, you know, because they have so much power, it needs to be used responsibly, right? And just, just as easily as you can make a, you know, use, your ability to read a web page to block ads or to you know improve the formatting of a website you could also use it to uh steal banking passwords mm -hmm. and the review is our the safeguard for our end users to make sure that like 
the extensions they're installing from the Google Chrome Web Store are, you know, good uh, and not doing the password stealing. Uh, and, and, you know, the users really, when they go to the Chrome Web Store, they're trusting Google with that. And we have right. to kind of live up to that uh, yeah. in a way. I think that's something I never really thought about before, but if it's a Google product, like yeah. the, the Play Store on Android or the Chrome Web Store, I just kind of inherently trust that there's not something horrible <laughs> on there. Like, it's, yeah. that's not the internet my parents told me to fear when I was a kid. Like, I can just go there and install stuff. Yeah. So. Hopefully that that's true. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we try every day to make sure yeah. that, that's, uh, that that keeps going. So Yeah, and that's not something that comes for free. I think that's something that yeah. is reflective of the work that gets put in to make sure that we're vetting the content that's being submitted and that users can have a level of trust that the items that are listed there are items that we have confidence in. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the developers that are listening to this will be developers that are acting in good faith, but we do genuinely see abuse on the Chrome Web Store. Yeah, all the time. And, and there's a large variety of different abusive extensions out there. You know, like I said, any basic things like stealing passwords all the way to uh, trying to edit the content of emails and 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 cover up, you know, that they withdrew money from your bank account and <laughs> stuff like that, right? Uh, Actually, when people submit malicious extensions, are they like, how dumb are they? Like, are they trying to just submit something where it's clearly just stealing a password or is it like backdoored into like a My Little Pony theme or something like, <laughs> is it something they're trying to be sneaky about it? Yeah, they're definitely, um, as we have evolved, uh, so have the uh, the bad actors, right? So maybe uh, 10 years ago, they could have gotten away <laughs> with uh, just posting a password stealing extension. But these days, um, they've gotten a lot more clever with it. And uh, we've had to, we're constantly improving our signals and, and our review processes and all of that to try to keep up with the speed of the, you know, the bad actors. And we still do see some of the, you know, yeah. quote unquote, script kitty or, or the, the novel's <laughs> right. entry yeah. uh, in targeting some. Yeah. Uh, popular game. My game first sites. malware. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Or they rip it from some other site and right. attempt to, to pass through our review process. However, yeah, as, as Zach was mentioning, they're quite uh, involved, you know, higher uh, funded, you know, groups that are targeting the users of, of Chrome and, and Google. And we fight so our you, best you said that the process has evolved and got better over time. What does the review process look like today? Sure. Yeah. So the, the review process is a mix between automated and manual reviews, right? We have a, a plethora of signals which we use uh, upon submission uh, to uh, the Chrome Web Store. And basically the, the point of the review process, uh, as, as, as Zach mentioned, is to keep users safe at the end of the day, comply with Chrome Web Store and Google policies. And it's sort of a, a multi-layered check to ensure that, hey, you know, if we get through the automated portion, there is that manual portion. Uh, some things uh, humans can pick up easier than machines, right? It might take some additional digging. You might need to use the context of, of the actual Chrome Web Store listing. Is, is the item actually doing what the developer says it does, right? There's no bait and switches going on. There's nothing nefarious going on. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, Oliver, you actually, before the call, sent out a uh, call to action for developers on our uh, mailing list. Thank you so much for that. Of course. Our mailing yeah. list. Um, for, actually, for those who aren't familiar, uh, or if the trust and safety team isn't familiar, since you don't have to monitor the <laughs> mailing list, uh, we have the Chromium Extensions mailing list, which is a, a Google group where folks can come and qu ask questions about uh, web extensions in general. We actually have people from like Mozilla and Safari that ask questions every once in a while and talk to you about other platforms as well. But um, we got some great questions from active developers on that. Uh, platform. I think you had a list of a few of them that I'm sure asked a few about reviews. <laughs> um, I'd love to get into what our developers are wanting to know about though. Yeah. So I just want to say thank you again to all of the developers that posted on the Chromium extensions mailing list. We can sort of try and think of some questions that developers may be interested in, but really getting those questions directly from developers and being able to bring those to you is is really exciting and, and really great. Actually, one question we got from Jackie Han, one of our Google developer experts for web extensions. They asked if 2000 extension updates need to be reviewed in a week, is, is that possible? I think sort of trying to get at how the Chrome Web Store has scaled over time and how the review process has adapted. Yeah, there's presumably more now than there was 10 years ago, right? Is that, are you having problems dealing with the increased activity? Yes, I mean, that's a great question. Um, just to start off, I mean, we, we review thousands of submissions every single day, right? We've made considerable investments over the last multiple years, um, you know, working on the influx of items coming into the Chrome Web Store. Um, we've got a couple of levers that we can pull, uh, both both on the manual review side as well as investments in the actual automated pipeline to sort of handle that. And uh, for any comments about developer review times, is, is, uh, basically, you know, in 2024, we've been able to review 95% of submissions in three days, right? That's up from 90% in 2021. And uh, within seven days, we review 99%, right? So that's typically where we're at now and we're consistently working to improve 
that that review time and handling out or ha being able to handle any influx or spikes within reviews. Yeah, I think that's a, something you and I both hear quite a bit from the community is you hear uh, not a lot of people saying it, but people very loudly saying their <laughs> extension is taking uh, five days to be reviewed or it's taking a longer time than normal to be reviewed. And I think something that's really not clear especially for folks that don't have uh, views into your algorithm, uh, is why is that happening? Like, what is, is there something, that, uh, there was another question from Art, uh, Artem, another from the mailing list is that, uh, what can developers do to make it easier, smoother for the review process to go quickly? Like, is there something that's causing reviews to go slowly? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why reviews can be slowed down. And there's a lot of things that developers can do to maybe improve that as well, right? Uh, and uh, some of the the more basic ones are just like making sure your item is uh, is well, like your code is well formatted and, it, and it's, it's, it follows all our readability guidelines, right? At the end of the day, there will be probably a human looking at your code and the easier you can make it for them, the faster they'll be able to get through it. And, uh, it, you know, other things like, making sure that you are thinking in advance about like how, how what is the safest way to implement whatever functionality you're doing? Like, how can I do this with the least amount of permissions? And the, like, so you're not trying to request a bunch of accesses and a bunch of these powerful APIs I talked about earlier when you don't actually need them for what you're trying to do, right? And sure. stuff like that. I think it's much easier, right? If there's an extension with a very narrow set of permissions, mm -hmm. we can see there's only so much this code could be doing. Yeah. Whereas if it's requesting a very large number of permissions, we need to, pay much closer attention and see, is there any way it could be abusing any of these different powers that it has? Yeah, absolutely. That's why, um, you know, it, it's very important that you think about that in advance when you're when you're developing your item. And, and uh, you're also limiting the just the amount of extra stuff in your item that's not needed, right? Like we like we've seen developers that accidentally submit, uh, you know, all of their unpackaged code along with all their packaged code. And then their item is twice as big. And we're like, okay, well, now it's going to take twice as long because we got to, even if it's, you know, it looks like it's, you know, just the, the unpackaged code, we still got to read through it. And, um, yeah. you know, is this a silly mistake or is there something really nefarious? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not always easy know. to distinguish those two. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So. And, and we've seen examples where people will have like a license.txt file and this puts at face value it looks like it's just an entire string of, of text mm -hmm. you know and but no it's got some javascript function hidden in really? some line buried nested in there referenced somewhere else in the file so there's a lot of scrutiny involved in, in yeah. some of these I, extensions i mean in all honesty being be, being fair to fair to good developers mm -hmm. right there's there's also some sense of like trying to future proof your extension mm -hmm. like oh you know what i was going to think of building x y and z in, in the future releases and you know was just asking for a whole bunch of permissions so uh, mm -hmm. That I mean, not not everything may be nefarious, as as Zach pointed mm -hmm. out, could be a genuine mistake. You know, I just included it. Yeah, uh, or it could be just future proofing as well. And that's definitely what we see a lot. Um, that's actually our most like our, most of the extensions that we review. Mm -hmm. The biggest verdict that we you know put on these extensions that that it ends up getting um, rejected for is for that exact reason. You know, they're they're kind of aggressively saying, oh, well, maybe I'll need that 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 um, permission in the future or mm -hmm. something like that. So we want to minimize the the crater of impact, so to speak, yeah. in that sense. I feel like that's something we can do, like as a platform, is try to make it easier. I know it's common for developers uh, to want to use a feature, but if they request a new permission, they might get disabled on update yeah. until the user has to re-enable. So it's almost easier to, uh, you know, ask for some a lot of things up front and then deal <laughs> with it later. So it, it's definitely... Optional permissions is a really good call out there. Oh, great call. So you don't necessarily have to add a permission if you're ever going to want to use that. Mm -hmm. Optional permissions are a really nice way to retroactively declare that a permission would be useful for some additional functionality. Mm -hmm. And then you can use the APIs that are available to request that information or request that permission at the relevant time and right. sort of give the user some indication, this is why I'm requesting this. And right. if the user says no, you remain installed, you remain enabled. You just can't use those one particular set of APIs that you're requesting permission for. Right. I saw that, that pattern a lot on mobile the last yeah. like five years. I think you've seen people, rather than request a location on install, you can request location when you hit the GPS button in the app. And <laughs> yeah. all of a sudden, the people want to use your app and don't think it's a weird malware tracking thing. Mm -hmm. So, we, we spoke a lot about sort of trying to make review quicker. I think one thing to quickly touch on, sometimes we get a question from a developer who is seeing that a particular update is taking longer than normal. Is there a point where they should be concerned if a review is taking longer? Should they reach out to us? Yeah. I mean, first off, uh, you know, we want to have the review process as streamlined as possible. <laughs> uh, the developers are sort of the, the, the cornerstone of, of the whole platform. And we want to make sure that if, if a developer at any time has questions about their item, you know, for example, if it's been seven days and their review hasn't been processed, 
certainly reach out to us in the one-stop support form. Um, they can get in touch with our team and we can, you know, see where what's going on, if there is something going on, or at least let you know that your review is, is being processed. Perfect. Awesome. Um, out of curiosity, you, uh, you mentioned that like readability is like really important for extensions. Um, I think at least when I think of it, it's sort of like making sure your code can be reviewed by a peer at your own company as much as it can be there because there is humans reading it. But does that mean they shouldn't do things like minify code of like, is that, is that completely true or is there anything, you have special magic tooling that means. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had some special magic tooling. <laughs> um, like our readability guidelines, we, we don't permit like obfuscation of code at all, right? So you can't be trying to uh, you know hide the way your code works by making it more hard and difficult to read. Like we definitely just like, that's just not allowed. It's blatantly against our policy. Minification is one of those things where like, um, it's it's kind of a standard practice in a lot of in a lot of these web development tools. And we know that, and but I, when at all possible, we would encourage developers to you know minimize the use of minification, mm -hmm. um, just because it, it does make it more difficult to read. And and no, we don't have any magic wands that we can wave <laughs> to kind of fix that problem. Uh, so yeah, it, minification is one of the things that is absolutely can impact the review times. Mm -hmm. Do they need to not even use minification? Should they have the complete comments inside their code, or what should they be doing? Yeah, we definitely acknowledge that minification is a pretty standard process in a lot of these, you know, web development frameworks and stuff these days. And so we don't outright ban minification, but we do encourage developers, when at all possible, to m minimize its use or or not use it if possible. If your builder has a setting to, you know, disable the minification, you know, you try to use that just to make it as readable as possible for our team. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so definitely on our side as well, we've seen developers that request permissions they don't necessarily need. I think the tabs permission is a really great example of that. In general, is that something you see? Are there other common mistakes that you see developers make? Yeah, that's definitely the biggest uh, mistake <laughs> that we see is, is we see developers um, request these kind of excessive permissions, you know, permissions they may not need, but or even some that they think they need. So like yep. specifically, specifically with tabs. Um, so to, just to elaborate there, what, what's the problem with the tabs permission? Why do we see so many mistakes? Yeah, that? yeah. So tabs um, actually doesn't give uh, access to the chromes.tab namespace. Mm -hmm. It instead gives access to specific uh, sensitive properties in the tabs query. So if you want to query certain tabs, it'll, it'll do that. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. we see that a lot, which is the kind of the main culprit or one of the main culprits specifically with that. It's not confusing at all. No. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, not, should, we should rename I'm that. not even sure what I just said. So. <laughs> it's not the exact opposite of every other feature on the platforms. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, going back to uh, remote hosted code, real quick um that's something i'm still not 100 percent certain I, I understand that policy when is something actually or what is the remote hosted code policy what, yeah. what counts as code yeah 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 so uh, javascript files um is is definitely something that counts as code so anything that is remotely hosted from a uh, javascript so if you're have a, have a, a server that's hosting some javascript code you got a cdn or something um, yeah exactly yeah um, that's exactly what um, you, you can't do in Manifest 3, V3 items. So it, but the, the biggest thing there is Manifest V3 with, with remote hosted code is um, no code. JavaScript is the biggest mm -hmm. thing. And the, and the reason why is because we want, um, we, we see a lot of abuse where, you know, during review, you submit your item, um, the code is doing one thing. And then the next day they say, okay, cool. I'm on the store now. Boom. It's bad. So, oh, interesting. Um, so yeah, basically time delay or something like that. Yeah, sure. Um, but, but yeah, yeah. So um, when we first launched the policy a while ago, um, a lot of our developers didn't even realize that they had remote hosted code even in their item. Right. So I, I think there was a problem earlier this year with uh, Firebase, right? With um, yeah. fire, uh, there was uh, Firebase Auth had calls that could trigger a uh, remote code, and most people weren't even using it. Yeah. But it got ended up being caught up in this check, and people started getting um, a hit. And actually, that would be something I'd like to be clear because I think a lot of folks, thankfully, don't get uh, a lot of uh, rejections or bans from the store. If some if they get something that's rejected, what's the implication? What happens if you upload an extension that fails? A review are they banned from the store forever or what what does that happen to their developer account i think it depends on um what they got rejected for so if they were trying to steal passwords you know we're trying to steal like cryptocurrency or something like that then yeah then you would probably get banned but um but yeah we have various levels of, of in the case of like the, the people that had remote hosted code they didn't realize correct like yeah so for, so for that no you're not going to get a ban for for accidentally uploading remote hosted code but um if we if we can kind of see that you were trying to use that remote hosted code to eventually do something there are other kind of signals that we can take into account, um, then then you could be. But I guess the safe thing is, you know, if it was an honest mistake, you don't have to be, you don't have to worry about it. You just got to fix it and then submit it again. And as, as you mentioned, Patrick, uh, this is a common mistake we saw developers making. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time it wasn't something that was being done nefariously. It was just not realizing that a library like Firebase maybe had a dependency. Um, did we do anything to try and address that? Like, 
how can we try and make that easier for developers? Yeah, yeah. So when we, when we first launched the um, RHC policy, um, our initial rejection email basically said, basically said hey, uh, you have remote hosted code in your file, now go find it, or your, your package to <laughs> go find it. So it's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack mm -hmm. in a way. But um, but yeah, so we've, we've since updated our rejection email, and now it says, okay, well, this is the file that's remotely hosted. This is what you should be looking for. Go in and address that. Yeah, not, not to be too much uh, pat on the back. I'm really happy because that was, I think, feedback that Oliver and I got directly from developers yeah. and brought to y'all. And you really quickly like changed your thing. So thank you for that. And thank you for listening. And thanks for the feedback. So yeah. Yeah. And yeah. another, yeah. you know, thanks to you all working with the community and uh, working with actually these uh, package developers, right? These library maintainers to say, hey, this is remote hosted code. And we, we see a lot of this in, in extensions. And the way that you all were able to handle the Firebase situation was, was very... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was great. We were happy to, I think. Um, um, anytime. Well, something that I, I maybe isn't clear to developers is that they're responsible for all code in their extent. It doesn't matter if they authored it or if it is a library, right? Like if they were thinking it's a Google library, so yep. it's fine. <laughs> why, why why couldn't I use it here? Uh, we were thankfully able to work with them to get that changed. But um, if there is ever an issue or a rejection that people get, uh, opening up something on that Chromium extensions mailing list or uh, reaching out to uh, one-stop support uh, would right. be a great way to uh, flag a problem so that we can uh, work with them that the extensions team can work with uh, external libraries to make that better. I think we're in sort of a transition period at the moment mm -hmm. where Manifest V3 is still quite new mm -hmm. and some libraries haven't updated yet to take that into account. Right. So there are cases where uh, a developer would be completely happy to adjust their library to be more compatible with our Absolutely. policies, but they just haven't had a chance. So flagging that to us, we can reach out, we can try and make that happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, potentially help the developer make the changes to the library. Yes, uh, put the weight of Google behind it. Yeah, right, absolutely. exactly. Right. And hopefully that makes things easier for everybody. Really, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we don't want this to be a burden for developers. We, yeah. we have to have these policies just to keep the ecosystem safe, but we really want to try and make it as easy as possible. Definitely. Like, unless you're a nefarious, <laughs> bad actor, like we want it, you to be successful. So please <laughs> reach out and we can work together to make it better. I do want to get to one more question from the mailing list. Artem asked, Review times are generally unpredictable. It can take anywhere from a few hours to 10 days. This makes it really hard for developers to react to user feedback in a timely manner and to roll out updates quickly. Is that something that we're seeing? Is 10 days a long time for a review? Actually, in 2024, our review time for 95% of items is actually three days. And this is up from 90% in 2021. Um, and 99% of reviews are published in seven days. Uh, so that's certainly not the norm. Um, however, we understand it is frustrating and, and we want to work as best we can with developers as well as the rest of our teams in order to consistently improve and speed up the whole publishing process. Yeah. Is there something they can do to uh, expedite reviews? We treat all um, all items and all developers that come into the store the same, right? Like the, and we follow the same review process for all items, right? It doesn't matter if it's a, if it's, you know, your item or, you know, somebody else's item. It's, it's, they're all treated the same. Um, and we don't really um, go about expediting. But what we do try to do is we try to address, you know, um, we try to look at, you know, why are these people, why, why do they feel the need to expedite the review? And we try to fix those underlying problems, right? So it's like uh, the, one of the more common ones we see is, you know, sometimes we'll get requests to expedite reviews because, oh, I just pushed an update and it broke everything, right? And now users can't use my extension. Right. Oh my goodness, like I need to get this solved immediately. Um, and that's why like one of the things that just launched recently was right. the Chrome Web Store had the new rollback feature, right? Where you could, uh, if something goes wrong in your update, you can roll back to the previous version without needing any reviews at all. Uh, and so things like that are things we partner with our teams to try to solve those underlying problems rather than, you know, giving somebody a, a one-off expedition of a, of a review process. And to jump, jump off that as well, Zach, um, if you look forward to, if you want to push an important feature or something like that, if there's a big um, feature launch that's coming, um, you can also delay publish. So you can submit it for review, like if, if you have everything, all your ducks in an order, maybe a month before the feature comes on. And then, um, you know, then then you control when it goes live, if, once it passes that manual review. Mm -hmm. So that's something also to, to, to bring up there. I'm super excited over time how we're seeing the, the Chrome Web Store so slowly mature and get more of these features, mm -hmm. the, the ability to stage a publish, the ability to do a version rollback. And I think it's easy to underestimate the amount of engineering work that goes into something like that. Yeah. Being able to safely roll back a review and be careful that, that again, isn't being used for abuse. It's, it's non-trivial, but it's something that we heard a lot from developers and was really important to us. Absolutely. Yeah, rollback is something I think we're both really, really excited to see. <laughs> it's a feature we've been wanting for quite some time. A lot of developers are asking for it. Um, 
on the topic of stuff that a lot of developers ask about, though, another one is uh, those those featured badges uh, on the store. I think it uh, imparts a lot of respect to an extension to show that it's being uh, featured on the Chrome Web Store. And that's something that a lot of people are uh, both wondering how to get it as well as how not to lose it. Like, are they afraid that if they have some kind of uh, minor infraction, does that mean they lose that featured badge? Is that something that is actually done algorithmically by humans? Like, what is the secret story behind <laughs> the featured badges? Um so, so a bit of history on featured badges, right? Um, this was this was something we we heard from our users um, that they needed an easy and a quick way to identify, hey, how good is this item? Uh, a user would typically spend time reading the description, looking at the reviews, the ratings, um, and the featured badges were supposed to be just that, uh, a quick way for them to look at the search results, glance, and see, oh, I should I could probably look at these items, right? Because we vetted them to be um, high quality. So, so what goes into getting a featured badge? There are largely two parts. One, um, an item is good, right? Obviously, no malicious behavior, complies with the store's policies. Uh, And the other part is making sure the item uh, is high quality in all sense, right? It provides a good description to the users, stating the functionality, uh, the assets that the developer is using are clean, are high quality, Mm -hmm. right? The user experience overall, right, from installing the extension to using it is 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 awesome, right? Um, and and that's the, both those things uh, need to be assessed to, in order to get that badge, mm-hmm. right? So both of them together go into into getting the badge. Now the question on on how you can retain that badge is uh, keep being good, keep making sure uh, your item is high quality. So every time you submit, uh, if you already have a badge, every time you submit an item and your item the new draft gets approved, uh, we reassess to make sure that you're still upholding and and meeting the bar for high quality. Uh, right, so this this happens every single time, mm. uh, right? Every but submission that they make. It that goes. is true. That is true. Um, in the unfortunate event that you know the item turns malicious, mm-hmm. right, or is taken sure. down, I mean, you end up losing the badge, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And my understanding is this is another case where we mix the automated and the manual review. So we do have a human looking at this and making a judgment as to does it meet all of these criteria that you outlined. That is true. Yeah. That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. It, and 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 the the tail end to that is how do I first get the badge? Uh, you can self nominate through the one stop shop form. So you can go ahead. And do that. What is the one stop shop form or one stop support form? One one stop support form. <laughs> I went into like the OSS. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, what is that for I folks went, that haven't used it before? Um, yeah, so you can go to, um, uh, we can, we, I guess we can drop a link in maybe the description or something. Sure, but, Google um, one-stop support. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a place where you can go ahead and um, uh, file an appeal. So if, if you have a, a violation on your item that you don't agree with, or if your item is taking a long time, um, you can go ahead and open a case and then we'll, we'll get somebody to look at it and hopefully help Absolutely. out there. And that is a human that reads those forms. Yes, yes. So that's a human, yes. Yeah. And I think we maybe we see that form used a lot in cases, like you say, where somebody has a rejection and they they want to discuss that with us. We don't see it used as much for general support or for self-nominations, but we're, we're really keen to see that. And Absolutely. Yeah, please do make use of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. The more people use it, the more better we can make it. So please reach out through it and get stuff there. Uh, if for some reason you're confused about stuff, you can also use that mailing list that we discussed before, Chromium Extensions. We're happy to help and point you to one-stop support more than <laughs> Absolutely. likely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, actually, that uh, speaking of the reviews and one-stop support, something that I think a lot of developers who have problems kind of see over time is they get those uh, rejection emails that have uh, code names on it. It's unusual code names. Yeah, some, something like yellow zinc or, or blue <laughs> copper. Yeah, you didn't like these as much. I came from a, a Microsoft background before where our errors were like hex code numbers. And so yep. the fact that I can look across the screen and not have to like squint to figure out the right numbers, I thought it was an improvement for me. But um, it, uh, I think it's kind of diver- like diversive or like uh, controversial uh, in the developer ecosystem, whether or not those are helpful or, or why do they exist? Like, why are we doing that rather than just saying, I think there was a question, Oliver, I think you said you found a question from a developer asking about that topic. Steve. Yeah, actually, Steve asked, when an extension is rejected, could you clarify why the feedback often comes in the form of a code like Blue Argon rather than a concise explanation detailing what adjustments are needed? And I think this is sort of some of the feedback we've heard from developers. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons why I think it would be interesting to look at if we can make this clearer in the future is when you initially see that code, it can be really jarring. And you think that's all the context you're getting and like you're really not sure how to go about addressing that. But actually, we try really hard, right, to have documentation that explains what these code mean and why you might be likely to get this and how you can rectify it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, if, if we were to ask this room right now on if they like Blue Argon or not, you're going to split the room in half, perhaps. <laughs> I mean, it's the greatest question ever asked ever since somebody asked, is hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> right. Um, okay, no, no, jokes aside, um, 
these 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 codes serve a purpose, and it's a dual purpose. Uh, uh, one is when you get a rejection email, um, right? The code is there, but over time, the the emails have themselves gotten pretty comprehensive in terms of um, as as. Cam pointed out, right? Uh, I think Lofton pointed out, you're you're going to get details on exactly where the violation is in the code, mm-hmm. along with specific steps on how you can fix them, right? Uh, and which policy you violated. So all of that, those details are right below the code, mm-hmm. right? What the code allows you to do is, we, we've got a pretty pretty big uh, comprehensive troubleshooting guide. Um, and if you were to go and like, oh, how do I make use of this troubleshooting guide? You could just go search for that code mm-hmm. and it'll give you more information on how to fix this particular violation. Yeah, it's a unique string thing. Blue zinc is not something that there's not a lot of websites where like bad description might show up a lot of stuff unrelated to Chrome. It's very easy to find on Google. You, yes. you search for the code and you hopefully come across our documentation. Right. I definitely do. And and that's something that are, are, are once, once, for example, you were to, let's say, have questions and if you were to like appeal that verdict, it's, it's pretty straightforward for us as well to like exactly look up uh, using just that code without having to read the whole, whole appeal. Yeah. Now, do all uh, rejections have some kind of code associated with them? Like, is there always a code or is it just the most popular ones that end up having one? No, nope, they, they should all have codes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, they should. So like even like policy uh, violations or something that are more broad. So I think one thing we hear a lot, including uh, Jackie Hahn asked on the mailing list, uh, some policies are vague and broad. Uh, how do you enforce such vague and broad things? Why are they confusing? Well, we definitely don't want them to be confusing. Uh, that's not what we're going for, right? Like, it, it, it's not, we don't want our policies to be, you know, so broad and so vague and so confusing that developers read them and they're like, this makes no sense, right? Like, but what the policies do need to have is they need to have a certain amount of flexibility. Um, we need to be able to apply them to a wide areas of abuse, right? Because our policies at the end of the day are there to uh, protect users and to prevent certain types of abuse. And uh, we need to be able to address any new and upcoming things or any unknowns or, you know, new ways to accomplish the same old uh, abusive patterns. And having them a little little flexible is is the way we do that. But and by no means are they meant to be confusing. They're meant to be, you know, g- they're meant to be guidelines for the developers. You know, this is how you can follow um, and to build an extension that is compliant with the core principles of the web store, uh, which are like be safe, be honest, and be useful for the users, right? Um, that's, they're kind of just like more specific guidelines on how to achieve those principles. Uh, but we don't intend for them to be confusing. And I think everyone would agree that we do have to use some flexibility, but we try and only use that flexibility when we need to because we're seeing some malicious activity and we need to make sure that that's covered by the policy. Yeah. We're not trying to be flexible to catch developers out or or to be sneaky and reject an extension. We really want mm-hmm. to, if we see a genuine use case and somebody doing something cool with the platform, we want to try and allow that on the store if we can. Yeah. Update the poli- We update the policy fairly regularly if we need to, if we think there's something that's unclear. For sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And we we definitely like to, you know, add in specific examples for different policies, you know, what right. might be in violation, right? To to kind of make it more clear whenever we can. And and for some of the more, uh, you know, complex policies or some of the ones that are a little more, a little more vague, uh, we try to proactively actually put out a FAQ you know, on our developer site that says, like, here are maybe some questions that developers might have. You know, we we go through these exercises where we think about, you know, how might these policies be interpreted and, you know, how can we preempt some of these questions? So we, we try to do that a lot. And, yeah, and like you said, we're not we're not trying to enforce for the sake of enforcing. We're not trying to, you know, have some gotchas that we can pull out of our pocket. Uh, like, these are meant to you know, improve the safety of extensions and then help our users out. So Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, both of us get uh, contacted from developers pretty frequently asking if something would be a policy violation. And that's something I'm always happy to have so we can shortcut that conversation as much as possible on their end and clarify, or at the very least start a conversation with y'all and maybe uh, figure out whether or not a policy needs to get clarified or updated. So uh, if anyone is wanting more information, they can certainly reach out to find out uh, more about specific policies. I think actually on that note, it would be interesting to talk about we we can't always give a definitive determination ahead of time oh. as to whether something is going to be approved or rejected during review. Why, why is that? Well, we have certain processes in place. And, you know, as we mentioned earlier, we've got thousands of extension submissions every single day, which we go through. And we, we, tr- we truly try to streamline that as much as possible. So we don't want to, um, you know, outside of appeals, right, outside of previous rejections, we try to adhere to this efficient process we've made in order to give people these these review times which which we've made and also i think it's just tricky right uh, when we hear a developer describe how they're going to approach something that doesn't always translate exactly to how it ends up being implemented and That's so exactly right. 
Yeah. Somebody can describe something in a way that sounds like it might be okay, but then when we actually come to reviewing all of the code in context, yeah. it's something that we can't allow. So it it can be really tricky in that sense. Yeah, I think it, if I had to guess, I think you have to you got, you all have to approach almost every developer as though they could be malicious, just because they could be. Even if we it's an established relationship, that could be someone who took over that account or something like. Uh, and so it's something where it's really hard to until you see the actual thing being approved. We can't preemptively approve or give a blanket approval to a concept until you actually see the code. Yeah, that's actually a really good call out. Like one of the risks that we do have to contend with, and I I think you think about a lot is the fact that. Even something being submitted by a trusted account may be being submitted by somebody who has compromised that account. So we or can't necessarily or sold that account exactly. So we, we can't always go on those previous signals to determine whether a new submission is safe. And and they might not even know that they have malware in their in their like item or something like that. So we've seen examples where libraries are malicious, but it's on a library level. That so it's like kind of even nested in that. So it's kind of um, it, it goes deep. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And y'all are responsible. It doesn't matter if it's the code, the library, a library in a library, or exactly like that. It's just a headline of Chrome is hacked or whatever. Yeah. But you know, so I, I, I can see your paranoia. I can sympathize with it. Um, that was actually one thing that I was kind of shocked we didn't get a question about from all the the wonderful questions we got on the mailing list was about uh, we get so many normally about um, extension being sold yep. or like people getting asked to sell their extension is that something y'all uh see a lot of are you getting like you, you somebody sells their million user extension and then they try to turn it into a, a password stealing thing or like is that how do you deal with that yeah absolutely we see it a lot um i'm sure i mean developers know um, they get the emails right and yeah. uh, we hear about them and yeah and the the reality is that a lot of times those purchase requests and those items that are being bought you know they're getting they may be getting turned into something nefarious. In fact, most of the time they are. Um, I mean, they wouldn't be offering you so much money if they weren't going to do something to make that money back with it, right? right. Uh, so, yeah, we definitely want to encourage developers to be careful. Uh, don't, you know, don't try to sell out and uh, compromise your users. Like, be, you know, be you're responsible for them, right? Like, you've built up the trust with these users and don't throw that away uh, mm -hmm. and, and all that. Yeah, their name is associated with something that could become a giant scam. So yeah. that can be. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I think not just about selling extensions, but um, also also an offer being too good to be true, which is oh, mm. include this piece of code, right? And, <laughs> right? and nothing changes, right? For you, everything is just the same. Why it may seem like a a, a fairly simple arrangement, right? Mm -hmm. uh, could lead to your item being taken down Absolutely. because. Chrome users and Chrome gives you access to millions, billions of users, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and with that access comes uh, the fact that they trust you uh, as well, right? And we trust you if you're allowing you on the store. So to break that trust of those users, mm -hmm. uh, like for one offer, uh, I would say, uh, please exercise better judgment. Yeah. I did want to quickly get to Andrew, who had a great question on the oh. mailing list about what issues you think are the most important to solve going forward. Like, is there anything looking forward that you're particularly worried about, excited about? You know, is there changes you've seen? I mean, it's it's no secret that uh, you know there's a lot of LLM adoption going on yeah. within the industry. Um, both uh, already uh, extension developers are, are seeing what ways AI can transform their products, as well as it sort of lowers the barrier to entry of, of newer developers that are interested in, in contributing to the platform. Um, so I think it's it's great, you know, overall win-win for the ecosystem, more developers, more users. Um, but yeah, I think on our side, we need to make sure we're, we're ready for that. Um, you know, how can we also adopt some of that technology and, and ease the review process, uh, make things faster for users, make things safer for developers? So that, that's one thing that, that came to my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think another focus, um, sort of going back to how we are structured as teams and how we work together is a big role that trust and safety plays is 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 making sure that our, our products are safer by design, by default, um, right? So we want to do more work in terms of, so that a lot of the, the pain points we've just heard of, of, of being stuck in a review for a longer period of time, because maybe it's a lot of code for us to review, right? And approve the item. That doesn't happen, that the that these these security features are built into the product. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of thinking going on around that front. How can we make our product safer by design, by default, um, so that the review process is much faster as well? And then obviously, as, as Cam pointed out, um, a lot of upcoming new technologies, exciting times for all of us. Mm -hmm. And we definitely want to leverage those um, you know, for making our process more efficient. Actually, while we have you all here, I'm curious, we're seeing lots of new AI developers coming to the platform. Are there common mistakes that you see people make when they're new to the platform and maybe 
trying to build some AI functionality into an extension. One thing I think would be good to keep in mind, uh, I know everybody wants to use all of the Gen AI tools out there, like different models that they want to use. Um, I, I would just recommend um, being explicit about the fact that you are, you, you are an extension that's leveraging these models and perhaps are not the official um, extension by some of the, the developers mm -hmm. of these models. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a good chance users are looking for a lot of different things. And, and what we've seen is without ill intent, right, um, they may be seen to impersonate some of these, uh, the developers of these models, mm -hmm. these large language models. Uh, and that's something we definitely see and we want to avoid uh, and caution ahead of time. Like you don't want your item to be, um, you know, getting rejected for impersonation. Well, I'm sure that wasn't your intent. Mm -hmm. uh, but then please, um, like not using trademarked images, for example, mm -hmm. uh, right? Not using trademark content um, in your extension. So I think I think those things would be would be good to look at. Right, it uses Gemini. It's not by Gemini or like it, a Gemini. Th that's perfect. Yeah. That's that's a great example. Yeah. yeah. Actually, that's a super interesting question. Extensions are quite unique in that often they're adding functionality to an existing site or service. How do we think about that? Like, what is our policy around? Can you build something that interacts with somebody else's website? Well, the, that's kind of the the whole point of an extension. <laughs> so yeah, I, I mean, it's it's definitely you know the intent one of the intended use cases. Um, and like we said. Um, we we try to structure our our processes and stuff to allow for as many things like that as as we can. But yeah, just like we said earlier, making sure that you're upfront about you know where where my where your extension works, what sites it interacts with, how it's going to interact with that, right? And making it very clear to users upfront that uh, you know that's what's going to be happening uh, is is very important. I think that's where we have the single purpose policy, and that that comes into play. Yeah, absolutely. So search rankings are really important to developers, and we often get questions about how a developer can improve their ranking in search. Is that something that you have any advice for? Yeah, I think in, in general, um, we, we definitely recommend developers to um, follow best practices, um, make sure their items are high quality, free of any kind of violations. Uh, those have been taken care of, um, right? Making sure the listing overall is great. Um, you're answering questions that you get from, from users on your reviews page. Um, essentially trying to be a, a model good developer overall. Um, and that's and that's just some of the the input that goes into into creating that into, in, into the search algorithm itself. Um, but that that's not something that we deal with directly. Mm. Um, and maybe perhaps um, could be something that we could delve in with the product team. Yeah, that'd be great. That's something I'd love to see. Oliver is maybe we can get some of the uh, Chrome Web Store PMs in here and do another question. With yeah, them. yeah, doing more of these would be great. And if if developers have any ideas for other questions they'd like to hear us ask to other members of the Absolutely. team, then please do share those. So often reviews is a really important factor for users deciding whether to install an extension. And often developers ask questions around if they see some reviews on their extension that they're not happy with, what can they do about that? Yeah, great point. Um, no, you hit the nail on the head. Um, users do care about reviews and ratings. And that's, an, that's something we heard that they deeply consider when making a choice of uh, to install an extension or not. Um, a few things to call out. Um, one. Um, we do work in the background. We do have we do have algorithms to take care of uh, malicious content being posted or nefarious behavior that we see um, certain individuals indulging in, right? Like going on a, um, a one rating spree, for example, or a bunch of different items. We, we do look at all of that, and our algorithms try and address most of it. But there are chances we miss something, and and that's where we request developers to use the one stop support form. Reach out to us and let us know because hopefully you're looking at your reviews and ratings, right? And if you notice something's off, someone's trying to malign um, or put up ratings and reviews that are not true to what your item is doing, please reach out to us through the one-stop support form. We will address and, and take care of those reviews. It's really great to know that there's a path forward for developers there. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, another thing I think a lot of developers don't take advantage of there is you can reply from a developer account directly to a review. Sometimes there's just a simple mistake. They're unable to see something and users can frequently change their review from a low one to a high one just based off some interaction. So just because there's a low review doesn't necessarily mean it's a, a final thing. You know, they can help interact and raise that over time. And actually even building on that, there's the support tab. So uh, that's a really nice way to accept questions and feedback from users and then you can sort of have more of a separation between the reviews that you're getting and questions from users. And that helps to give people a place where if they have feedback, they don't have to leave that as a review. They can contact you in other ways. Yeah, that was I didn't even realize the support tab existed when I first started here. The support tab <laughs> on the individual uh, item listing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. If you go into, I think it's the account settings for your 
uh, for your developer account in the developer dashboard, you can enable this for your items. Mm -hmm. And then you can receive and respond to feedback from users directly. It's like a little mini forum about your uh, exactly directly yep. on this stage. It's great. So I'm definitely personally interested in security, and I find some of the abuse that we see super interesting. So I'm really curious to just sort of go around and do you all have examples of really interesting abuse that you've seen on the store? Where to start? <laughs> uh, um, uh, I kind of mentioned it earlier, but uh, one of the more fascinating things that I, I it's very memorable to me is the there was a Chrome extension that would you know it would they were taking money from your bank account and then it would actually go into your email when you went to your email, your mail inbox and it would edit the emails that you got from that bank, right? So instead of saying, you you know, you transferred $500 to this account, it would say like, oh, you know, new login detected and it would use your IP address. So it looked like, oh, you're just like, oh, I just logged in, right? So like just one of those, another one of those emails you get every day uh, whenever you log in. Uh, so yeah, things like that. Like it really show, goes to show like how powerful extensions can be. Where the extension can can be transfer siphoning money and then also covering its own tracks like in real time. So really, sort of out of the box thinking and yeah. and, and thinking through the, the whole process, not just how do we do the the nefarious thing, but how do we cover our tracks as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, one that that never um, fails to surprise you is is items that that generates social media engagement using your accounts. Mm. Um, again, as we say, permissions are very, very powerful, right? Cookies permission, for example. So once they have access to that, they're going to use your, um, you know, log into your social media accounts, generate likes, comments, um, right? And so this is all the traffic that is going to all of these other, um, other platforms from the Chrome Web Store. Um, never fails to surprise you. And then you always keep wondering if social media is for real. <laughs> Yeah, and in this one, we're all aware of phishing, right? We, we all know phishing's a thing, but Chrome extensions, we've seen multitudes of examples, um, you know, targeting specific regions of the globe, in fact, where they would uh, attempt to fish users by actually quickly changing uh, the actual URL, right? So, for example, banking, mm -hmm. um, and, and Zach touched on it a little bit, where we've seen them impersonate high-profile banks in Latin America and across the globe and, and quickly switch to a, a compromised host that they they own and and at that point they'll engage in sort of that siphoning that, that zach mentioned it's uh quite alarming to see you know how many truly bad actors there are across the world and and this, the detail they'll go into the different segments of the population to target uh yeah one of my favorite ones that dare i say favorite but one that caught me by surprise was um uh, a crypto item so what it was doing it was it had the the clipboard permission and basically uh, the item was was flavored around uh, crypto. So it was it was no surprise there. But um, essentially, the item would replace the wallet address of um, of the one that you tried to copy into a, you know, a, an input text box. And it would um, it would replace it with their own version of that that wallet. So essentially, you know, when you thought you were sending it, you know, if I was going to try to send you something, it would actually send it to this third party and you'd have no idea. So it kind of it was very sneaky, very sneaky. I think that just goes to show why permissions are really important, even for something that may seem somewhat mundane, mundane like the clipboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and unfortunately, some of these cases they don't they don't need that much code, right? They don't yeah. need that much code to execute some of this nefarious behavior. So we we try to stay as vigilant and on top of these things as we can. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, because I think that's one of the shocking things is you kind of you guys have to act almost like every single update to any extension could be doing that could be actively stealing people's money, could be actively stealing their cookies and ruining someone's life, which sounds stressful. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, all it takes is like one line of code. Yeah. You know, they, they, it could be just one extra line they added in that, you know, takes the cookies and sends it somewhere and that's all it takes, right? So you gotta be very vigilant uh, in this line of work. You know, we can't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> We're very tired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for joining us here today. I think this has been wonderful. Um, if, uh, I, I was all the questions I had to ask Oliver, did you have anything you wanted to cover before we wrap up? I, I think that pretty much covers it. If developers do have questions, please do again, go on the Chromium extensions mailing list, submit those questions. I'm, I'm hoping I'd love to do this again in the future if you're all up for it. Um, and we can also just try and relay questions to you and get answers mm -hmm. to developers. Um, but yeah, one, once again, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who's been listening and thank you for keeping us safe. <laughs> Certainly. And, and, and thanks, Oliver and Patrick. Uh, and thanks thanks to our developers for really understanding sort of what goes on behind the scenes and, and bearing with us, you know, as we review your items and understand truly why we have to do this, you know, in the scrutiny and the level that we do uh, while trying to maintain that, that good publisher experience. So thanks again.